Okay. So, uh, welcome, excuse me, welcome everyone. My name is Tricia Gordon, and um, we have a really good agenda today. I'm excited to introduce shortly Brenda Knox from uh, Wake Forest, who's going to be talking to us about her or, or their um, portfolio tool <clears throat> in just a little bit. But first, I wanted to see if anybody is on the call who has any updates on any projects or other announcements. I guess the, the biggest thing coming up is the Sakai Virtual Conference next Wednesday. Um, very exciting. What a, it's a great program. I'm, I hope you all have had a chance to check it out and probably some of you are, are presenting. So uh, I imagine that's where a lot of our um, usual Participants are probably preparing for their presentations next week. Um, so, sorry for the light participation today. Um, we might get a few more people joining us on the call shortly. Um, we hope so. Anyone else have anything they want to announce or um, talk about? Okay, then I wanted to uh, move on to the JIRA of the week, and I had seen something come across an email last week that um, I always get concerned when I see something about calculations of grades not working correctly, and this particular JIRA, let me paste it into the chat is about Samago, and um, it has to do with a calculated question type not, ra not rounding correctly, or actually rounding too many times, and then um, uh, resulting in a wrong graded answer. So um, if you guys want to go ahead and open that up in a browser and take a look at that, and I'd like to hear if you have any comments or thoughts around that. Okay, and I don't know if you guys are just taking a moment to look at that, um, but if you don't have any comments, we can move on. All right, well, I guess that means, uh, okay. Ooh, I would say that anytime incorrect, yes, we would want to address it, absolutely. So I guess I would encourage people who feel strongly about this, as, as I do and Matt does, um, to comment in that JIRA um, and make your concerns known. Um, you actually have to look at the images in that JIRA to really understand the issue. Um, they didn't they didn't document it in text, but they did a good job of um, identifying the problem and, and how it creeps in uh, on the two screenshots that are provided. Yeah, Matt, I do too. I do like that, but I also think that text is important just in a comment or the description because um, that's an accessibility uh, issue for sure for some people, and um, I think both are the way to go. Okay, 
So we're going to move on then and welcome Brenda Knox again from Wake Forest, uh, who's going to introduce us to the portfolio tool at Wake Forest. So Brenda, I've just made you a presenter if you want to go ahead and share your desktop. Okay. This is Brenda, and thank you for having me. And um, I, this is the first time I've used Big Blue Button, so let's all wish me luck. <laughs> yes, good, good luck. Can you see anything yet? Let's try this again. Does anyone see anything? I'm guessing you can't hear me, or? I'm hmm. sorry. I had muted my phone and forgot. Um, we, we don't <laughs> see anything yet. Sorry. <laughs> All right, let me try that again. Um, gives me an option to say full screen, so I'm clicking full screen. But then nothing happens. Do you know what that means? Uh, so you might. Want to uh, just check behind your screen to see if there's anything waiting for you to to agree or accept. I don't see anything. Do you? Right. Um, so, Brenda, let's see. You're using Google, right? So, is it something that you could share the URL and I could present it and, and then, but you could talk. You could do the talking. I can do that until the demonstration, but that would be kind of hard oh. to do. So, um, I and I checked my, I checked the Java version and everything. So, I'm not sure why it doesn't want to do anything. I'm so sorry. I don't either. Uh, you you should have, you know, the presenter should have all the right settings to do whatever. Uh, oh, okay, Louisa is asking, what browser are you using? Firefox. Firefox, okay, and that's what you're using. So Louisa says that's the recommended browser. Yeah. Um, hmm. All right. So let me, do you want to share the URL and uh, then we'll see if we can figure out what to do for the demo <laughs> yeah. when that time comes. You can just paste it into the chat. Yeah, I'm grabbing it right now. Okay, great. So I'm going to click on that and let me share my desktop first. So when I'm sharing my desktop, it does ask me about full screen. I'm just going to share your main screen and then, oh, I see a message at the top of the browser that says allow blah, blah, blah to run Java and I have to click allow. Did you see that? I see it now. Okay, well, I'm going to give you presenter privileges back because I think that's the only thing in the way. Wow, allow and remember. Okay, so try again. I will. I'm 
anything? Not yet. You might want to you might want to cancel out of it and start again. I did. Okay. Oh, Hurricane something popped up now. Ah, better? Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. Good. All right. So the tool that we're using is called HMH Portfolio, and we're using it for our Master of Arts in Counseling degree, which is fully online. And it used to be called, when we adopted it, school chapters. So if anybody is familiar or has looked at school chapters in the past, you'll recognize this when you see HMH portfolio. It was acquired and its name changed to something I like less, but that's how it goes. Um, they were primarily motivated by the fact that they had a specific disciplinary accreditation called KCREP um, that they needed to be able to demonstrate to the accreditors examples of work and statistics on and proof on meeting all of their KCREP standards. Um, so what they did was their curriculum is lockstep, so all of the students take the same courses up until the very end when they specialize in either school counseling or clinical mental health and their clinical opportunities are in different areas. But up until then, they all take the same classes. And they identified what they called signature assignments in the curriculum that could be associated with a particular standard in KCREP. So they started out with task stream and found it unwieldy. They started with it because our education department uses it, but our education department doesn't have the students do any of the work. Oops, sorry. Doesn't have the students do any of the work. The faculty upload evidence, um, and so the students never actually see the portfolio at all. Um, we kind of wanted the students to be more involved in the process and uh, more reflective of how certain assignments were meeting certain criteria. We moved to school chapters after I saw it in a demonstration, and it's now called HMH Portfolio. We use the basic LTI integration, and the company built the standards for KCREP into our system for us, which was also a nice perk. And we just found it to be more straightforward and more clear what it was you were doing, used more plain English kind of language. Um, the basic LTI integration accomplished authentication, so we have a tool inside Sakai that we can click on without re-authenticating be put into school chapters. Um, the process of doing that, clicking from Sakai into school, well, HMH portfolio, um, creates a course in HMH portfolio, which obviously is a standalone web-based portfolio as well. But we actually create a course in Sakai, add the tool, configure it, and then by clicking on that, it creates a, a course and populates it with the students that are in the Sakai course inside HMH. Uh, one downside is that it does not place the student directly in the HMH course that corresponds to the Sakai course that they're linking from. Um, so it puts them into HMH, but they are, um, they have a list of all the courses they have that they are in a portfolio, in the portfolio for. And they have to choose that course again. Um, we have a voice thread integration through LTI that puts you right in the specific space that you're supposed to be in. This one doesn't. Um, yes, I guess, that's <laughs> what I'll say. Um, and once that was accomplished, what the course developer, course designer, or instructor has to do is um, build rubrics. Well, first they have to build what's called a portfolio structure, which is the KCREP standards being added. Then they create assignments and rubrics that are tied to those standards. And then um, those signature assignments are tied to the standards. Oh, that's a duplication. Sorry about that. What it didn't do and what we wanted it to do because um, the, the faculty really, really liked the way they got assignments and graded them inside the portfolio. So this was where 
I think teaching and learning kind of uh, accreditation was what motivated the use of this, but teaching and learning got a boost at the same time. So assignments are graded in here using rubrics very clearly, and feedback is given very easily for different parts of the process. So and you'll see that when I do the demonstration. And the faculty loved it, but they were having to go into HMH and grab the grades for each assignment and then go back into the gradebook in Sakai and manually enter them. And they said, wouldn't it be great if they could just go over automatically? So we worked on that, and that's what I'm going to show you today a little bit about. Also, because in the process of that, we have information about um, performance on a, and um, tied to the standards, we can, that information is now in the Sakai database space. Um, so we can do some demographic reporting. So we can compare it to information from our student information system that's demographic, race, gender, age, and uh, draw some conclusions about how the program's functioning for different groups of people. All right, I think that was all my slides. So now I'm actually going to go to production environment. I need to go to production first. Right, so I'm going to be in our production environment for a little bit because that's where our actual standards and rubrics live and I want you to see them. But then to uh, demonstrate the synchronization, I'm going to go to our pre-production environment. Because of what this tool does, we can't turn it on in our production environment until we're in between two semesters and we have um, made the courses ready for it because it, it also creates a column in the gradebook for every assignment that's in HMH. And currently, we have manually created columns for those. So we have to take those out and in our master courses and allow HMH to run to create the columns. We're not doing that till December 7th. So um, the first thing I wanted to show you was that if you click on, I'm in a test course, and if you click on the HMH portfolio button on the left-hand side, um, you'll see this, which looks like HMH portfolio. Um, I'm assuming that um, most of you have familiarity with LTI, external LTI tools, but there is a configuration button in the upper right for this particular tool with a URL, a key, and a secret. We also, in order to make this work, um, have to check the boxes for send names to external tool and send email addresses to external tool. Uh, there's another thing in here that, that was new as of this last version that we upgraded to that said allow external tool to remotely install tools and lessons. I have not, I'm not exactly sure what that does, but I'm going to be checking that because it sounds good. Um, the other thing that got added was this, routing grades to gradebook. Um, looks great at first, and I thought maybe we had completely wasted our time, but it, it doesn't make sense to us because it creates a single gradebook item and puts a grade in it, and, and the portfolio has a number of assignments in it, so it doesn't really make sense, um, and I haven't seen it actually move anything. I think it might have to, uh, I think it might be related to the use of gradebook in HMH portfolio, and we aren't using that function because we use the gradebook in Sakai. So, back to the tool. I'm not certain while you're doing that. I'm not certain, Brenda, if the fact that it doesn't, even though it's not, it doesn't, is it, blah, 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 is it configured right uh, to accept multiple assignments? Um, it sound, I, it, I believe there is a property that also has to be turned on to get that to work, um, that particular LTI configuration to work. I will talk to our people about that. Um, I should have caveated at the beginning that I'm sort of the end user communicator, not the person who did the programming for this. So sometimes I don't know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, I can only show you what happens from a what we requested from a teaching and learning standpoint and a faculty comfort standpoint and what we got. So I will talk to our sysadmin about that property. Um, so I think I mentioned earlier that there are portfolio frameworks 
which is where the standards enter in. I'm going to click on that button. We have a number of standards. We use some old ones, and then we have some new ones that are KCREP 2016 down here at the bottom, Professional Counseling Identity. I'm going to open that one. And you can see that there are different standards and substandards. And if I click on any one of them, I can, at the portfolio framework level, add evidence or text for that. But that's not usually what we use those for. We have a number of those. We also created in advance some rubrics. And this is a table of some of the rubrics we have in the course. And I'll come back to something that we're going to actually have a whole lot more rubrics soon because of this, um, because of this particular enhancement. But I'll come back to that in a minute. So I'm going to show you one of the rubrics. This is our written assignment rubric, which is fairly detailed, has several sections for the depth of the paper, the style of the paper, and the mechanics. When a faculty member clicks on one of these boxes, it assigns the appropriate number in the far right box associated with that level of accomplishment. It also gives them a spot, a text box in the far right column to add further comments about specifically about that particular item to the student. And the student will see all of that when they get their assignment back. This, this ability to grade in this way with the rubrics is has was very, very, very attractive to our faculty. They didn't realize that that came with the accreditation stuff. So um, they have actually are now sort of pushing to put all of their assignments in um, HMH portfolio rather than using the assignments tool in Sakai because of their rubric grading capability. Um, we don't purchase any of the additional services that might allow that for Sakai right now, and it came with this. So there's at the very top of this screen, uh, it says my courses. And I think I mentioned earlier that when we go into HMH portfolio, it puts you in a list of all of your courses. So I'm not specifically in the sub course that I clicked into HMH from. And I have to actually navigate to that. It's less than ideal because our students are in multiple classes um, at the same time or historically. But this is a view if you went directly into that specific course. And the only reason I had access, I had access to the rubrics and the other stuff is because I actually have an administrative level privilege in HMH. The students wouldn't have that. They would just mostly have a list of courses as well as their connections and their stuff. Their stuff is uh, their ability to craft a more of a showcase portfolio out of the stuff that they have submitted as evidence. And they can have multiple, they call, they're called stories in HMH, and they can have multiple stories to different audiences. And they're completely in control of that. <clears throat> so once I'm in a specific course, there's now a sub bar menu. And if I click on assignments, I'm going to see a list of three assignments. If there were students in this class, there would be a list of students down the left-hand column and spaces for each of their grades underneath the underneath each of the assignments. And what I'm going to show you is a little bit about how we use the rubrics and the standards. So I'm going to create a new assignment, at least start to. We're going to call it assignment four or assignment five. I can't remember how many we had. I can enter descriptions here, instructions. I can give it a due date. A little cumbersome. The, the date picking information is a little bit cumbersome. I think it's due on Halloween. Again. You can also then select a rubric. Remember that list of rubrics I was using? If I choose the written assignment rubric, I can also preview it to make sure it's the rubric that I want. I can also create a rubric at this point. I can also associate more than one, actually not just one, but more than one specific standard 
with a particular assignment. It's also possible to assign certain rows of a rubric to a particular criteria that you're trying to measure. And then I can click Create Assignment. And since the assignment was successfully created, so that if I look at the assignments now, I'm going to see that we have a new one called Assignment 5. So I wanted to do that in the production environment where we actually have some meaningful rubrics and standards for you to see, but now I'm going to switch to the pre-production environment. Does anybody have any questions so far? Uh, there have been a few questions that that have been posted in the chat. Um, I'll go ahead and moderate that. Um, I think you've already answered this question, but Fawei wondered, uh, does each portfolio have more than one assignment? Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to. We can have as many assignments as you want. The way we're using it, there's usually at least two signature assignments in each course, and there's a portfolio for each course, the way we're using it, but it doesn't have to be that way. Because it puts you in at the very top, there could be a single portfolio that all of the assignments associated with different courses are in. Does that answer yeah. your question? Okay. I think so. Um, and then Jennifer wondered, um, how did you get data from task stream into HMH, or did you just start over with HMH? Because <laughs> they, got, they couldn't oh, get into task stream at all. They really couldn't get into TaskStream at all, so they never started actually collecting data. Just during the setup process for TaskStream, they got um, frustrated and never really collected data into that system. So we started from scratch in HMH. Gotcha. So Jennifer says that they're using TaskStream now and agrees that it's unwieldy. So too bad, Jennifer. <laughs> no my question. <laughs> we can get data out of um, HMH obviously into data tables in Sakai. So I would think that if you could do that, you could write code that would allow you to write that back into HMH at mm -hmm. some point. And I will say that the vendor, um, I don't think it's a it's a fairly new product, and so it has certain uh, features and capabilities that are somewhat immature. But they have been extremely responsive with us because they're young and hungry, I guess. Um, about things. One of the things that we didn't like was that it was very difficult for a faculty member to say pass a paper back for an assignment. Um, the submissions for the assignments can either be inline text or they can be um, a file or a document or an image, some sort of evidence that they've met the criteria of the assignment and the criteria of the standard. And our faculty, when they had students writing papers, would submit Word papers, Word documents, they're not using our Google document capability here. And they wanted to be able to send those papers back with comments on them. And that wasn't easy to do, but the vendor made it possible for us. They added a capability to the, to the tool as a whole that allowed us to send papers back. So they've been pretty responsive when we've asked them to change something. And because of this um, integration we did with the grade syncing, we had to have cooperation from them as well on that because we had to have access to data on their servers and they gave it to us and they worked with us very closely. I would say that. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Do you, can you add more than one HMH tool to a Sakai site? <laughs> I have accidentally added more than one <laughs> HMH tool to a Sakai site. But when you click on it, it always goes to this one home site. So the home site that covers your account as a whole in HMH portfolio. So I think um, having two different buttons, they would both take you to the same place. And wouldn't be much point to it, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. If they went into a specific space and you could somehow specify that, that might be meaningful, but they, they don't. Right. At least, at least yet. I mean, that's my next task for them is to get them to figure out how to be uh, aware of the course the link is coming from. Gotcha. That would be nice. Uh, Terry asks, are these site-specific portfolios or are they assigned to the student as a comprehensive portfolio for their evidences and activities? They're both. Um, there is a course for each of our, in HMH portfolio associated with each course that we have 
in Sakai, so in, in the program. So a faculty member can look at the, por the portfolio evidence just for their course by looking at it that way. But because they're tied to this overarching um, standard for KCREP, they can also look at it at the institution level. You might see at the top there's a My Institution button. And some of the things you can do there are do reports that cross over between the courses. And it's also possible, I think I mentioned it before too, the My Stuff, they can um, create their own stories. So they can choose the things from the evidence that will um, to make a particular story, say for a particular employer they want to apply for, they can pick out specific things and create a view for that person, uh, more of a showcase portfolio. And they can have multiple ones of those. So it's sort of both of those things. And can students take their portfolios with them out of the system into another format that could be used elsewhere, do you know? No, I'm not really sure. Um, we used to, we've also used Digication some, and I know that Digication has a definite plan for students to be able to retain access to that portfolio after they leave for a nominal yearly fee. Um, I'm not really sure what HMH portfolio does. I should find out. Yeah, just curious. Um, it does no, seem to be a, a criteria that that students would certainly be interested in. Yes, that makes sense to me. That's one of the things I liked about education. Right. So you, uh, one of my questions was, um, have you guys done an evaluation of various portfolio tools, and what made you decide to select HMH? <clears throat> I think we did a very unofficial evaluation, which is why I can't answer the question about whether um, it'll let students keep it, because if we'd done a formal um, needs analysis, um, we would have identified that as one of our requirements, and we, I would know the answer. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it was pretty informal. Um, so they first started using Task Stream because the education school used it. Um, education department used it and didn't like that. And then I came back with both education and a couple other things like school chapters. They looked at them. Um, and the one that made the most sense to them, that used language they could understand, I think, are the one, is the one that they, that they picked. Um, I was making sure that it could do the, the basic thing. So I think inside my head, I had a some criteria for what it needed to be able to do on a basis level, like be able to associate assignments with standards and create reports and the students have the ability to make their own story or their own portfolio. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't, I wasn't really stri um, strictly looking in any other way. Right. Okay. That's the way for it. curious. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, can you share what the cost is per student? How do they it's break about that down? Yeah, it's about $69 per student. Per year per or per year. semester? Per year. And and so do you have a mechanism for charging that back to the student? Do we have a what? A mechanism for charging the student? We don't. We pay for it from the program. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And is this your first semester using this system? No, we've been in it for about three semesters now. So we've got data from about three semesters. We're gradually rolling it into the existing courses following a particular cohort of students. Um, but we've been in it for about three semesters now, but we didn't have the grade sync and won't have it until next semester. So. Gotcha. Well, it looks it does look like a really easy to understand, and I, I do like the the language, um, as you pointed out, that it's you know um, very clear. Yeah, I I have some more stuff to show that would show you the grade sync if you want to see it. Great, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, so I'm in our pre-production server now. Um, it's a different color at the top. Um, and I'm going to first put you in the grade book, in Sakai's grade book, and let you see that there are six assignments, assignment one through six currently in here, and that assignment three has no grades associated with it. 
So everybody's familiar with what the gradebook looks like, and I wanted you to see what it looks like now. So I'm going to, going to go into the HMH portfolio part, and I'm going to choose the course that I'm in. In this case, because this is our pre-production server, there's only one. <laughs> so this is the easy one. <laughs> but you saw the list when I was in the production server. And once I'm inside a course, I again want to look at assignments. And I'm in this course as an instructor, so I see all the lists of students. And I see that I have assignment two through six. I don't have assignment one because that's the one that actually got created because of the, the configuration button that you told me I probably need a property to turn on. But I also have assignment A and assignment B. So we've created assignments inside HMH that aren't currently in the gradebook in Sakai. Um, we also have a submission to assignment three right here. So I'm going to actually go in and grade that submission by clicking on that. I could, there could be files that have been uploaded in addition to this text assignment text box, but in this case, I, for the sample, I just put in information in line. And if I click on the rubric tab, I have a very nominal rubric here, and I'm going to give myself a fair, which automatically put a six out of eight in the column over here, and say I can also give more feedback in the box above. So we're actually not seeing your rubric. I'm not, if you oh, really? have that open. Yeah. Do you see the tabs across the top of the I voice? See the, the assignment tab? Well, underneath it, hmm, I wonder if they're using frames and that's not coming oh. through or something. It is showing up now. It's being, it's slowly appearing. Oh. <laughs> All right, I will slow down just a teensy bit. So this is a very nominal rubric that just had one criteria and three levels of accomplishment. But when I clicked on the box for FAIR, um, it turned it orange, and it assigned the six in the bottom right corner for the score. And then I added a comment right above that. I have to actually click the Save Comment button by itself. Um, but that also means that I can put a separate comment in and save it for each row. And I can not submit the grade yet, but if I come back, the comment will be there and the, and the grading stuff will be there. So if I want to grade in pieces, I can do that. Um, and then if I want this to be graded, if I'm ready to turn it in as a grade for the students, I would click Submit Grade. So now the student has a grade, and if I were to look at rubric again, it would um, not really allow me to change anything, which is why it gives you that warning that you may or may not have seen since it seems to be moving slowly. Yeah, we're still on the, what I'm seeing, I'm still seeing the discussion rubric, and uh, I haven't seen you click the submit grade. Oh, we got, there. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting reconnected. I got a connectivity problem. I don't know if you did. I'm okay so far. Good. Uh, back. Maybe it was just me. So I'm now going back to the big table that looks like a grade book with students along the left-hand side and assignments around the top. Um, let's see if I need to do anything else there. All right, so now you know we have two columns in here that aren't in Gradebook in Sakai, and we also have a grade in Assignment 3 for my student account that is not in Gradebook yet. Um, when we have this turned on in the production environment, I'm going to the administration workspace in Sakai now. Um, we will be using the job scheduler tool to mm -hmm. run that sync job. And we have a, a tool here that's called HMH Portfolio Grade Sync. It currently has no triggers, so it doesn't run automatically right now. Um, but I could put a trigger in that basically said, name it, and then put a cron expression in that would let me say, run this once a day, um, or run this every five minutes. Whatever happened then. Also, right here, I can tell it to run the job right now. Um, I'm actually going to show you another tool that our programmer developed 
I, I don't know how I'm supposed to say this, Inokado, it's a Wake Forest custom tool, and he did present it at the conference last summer. And I'm sure he could tell you a little bit more about it, but I think that primarily it's a tool that enables us to authorize a job to run even though we're an individual account and not a global account when we log in. So I think it, it makes it easier for us from an end user standpoint to authorize that a job run repeatedly. So if I click, the, it's still says school chapters. If I click on that, there are some settings that involve a key and a secret. And then I can click an authenticate button where it asks me if I can, if I'm going to give author, authorized access for a particular account to run something. And then this button that says sync resources is the same thing as run job now in job scheduler. So I'm going to push that button now. And the user interface is a little, you know, you can tell a programmer built this. <laughs> but we didn't need anybody to know how to use it but me and a couple other people. So um, it's fine for us. It doesn't let me know that a job has actually run. However, if I go back to that site we were looking at, Now, everyone, cross your fingers. <laughs> I tested right before I got on. If I go back to gradebook, you can see that assignment A and assignment B columns have been created in the gradebook in Sakai. And you can also see that for assignment three, which had nothing graded, it now has my six out of eight. If I go to that assignment, I also see that everyone else has nothing there. At first, it put zeros in when it did the sync, and that was very disturbing to the people who hadn't had their assignments graded yet. So it now still just has empty space in the others, but it has my six. So well, that seems to work pretty well. Yes, it did, <laughs> didn't it? Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna. I'm looking at some of my. I have made a list of some other points just to make sure that that I point that I covered them all. Um, we were encouraged when the faculty w were very interested in using this rubric-based grading more for more of their assignments, not just for this one, the ones that were signature assignments. So that was kind of a pedagogy bonus on top of the accreditation need. Um, and the being able to pass papers back was also a pedagogy bonus. Um, initially, the rubrics were set up to be percentages. So we'd have a written assignment rubric that was out of 100, so like a percentage. But the written assignment in any given course might be worth 50 points or 100 points or 150 points. So some sort of conversion has to be made between the rubric score and the actual points in the course. Um, we were unable to do that as part of the integration or in Sakai um, or in HMH. So again, that's probably another thing on my list for them to try to work on to refine this a little bit more. So what has to happen is that we have to have a separate rubric for each of the point values of the assignment. So we'll have five copies of a written assignment rubric, one for 30 points, one for 50 points, one for 150 points, something like that. It's not difficult to copy the rubrics and just change the point values, but, but it's a little messy in the list of rubrics. It's going to be much longer. And that's all I have. That, that was really great. Uh, I really enjoyed the demo, and um, so thank you, Brenda, so much. Jennifer, uh, for some reason, a big blue button is not letting me see your latest chat. Can you? Ah, oh, there it is. Uh, so we have another question. Is, part, is support part of the cost of the tool? Um, not end user support directly, but tier two. So they come to me or they come to one of our other um, staff people or course designers and they get help that way. I can go directly to school chapters. Gotcha. And you're the interface. So yeah. Between the users and the vendor. Or now, there, yeah, there is a support at schoolchapters.com email address. Mm -hmm. and. I'm fairly certain that a student could email that and get an answer. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, they're coming to me. Okay. 
Well, so it sounds like they are very um, responsive to you guys um, and your request for customizations and your accreditation requirements and so forth. So that's really a big plus. Yeah, at least so far they have been. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be curious to hear from you again, maybe at next year's Sakai conference on how things are going with the gradebook integration stuff and uh, just in general um, how how it's working out. And now that when we turn it on and start collecting data and tables inside Sakai, we're moving on to another step, which is to run reports on that data against our demographic data. So and reports even within HMH. So there'll be that to report at some point. Yeah, excellent. Uh, earlier in the chat, back in Big Blue Button, I just want to point out that Jolie um, shared a link to the um, LTI basic outcomes that you might want to share with your sysadmins. And we have another question. Um, do students like it? Yeah, they do. They like getting the feedback on a rubric format. And did the students use it much to actually create their own portfolios? They haven't yet. Yeah, they haven't okay. yet. That's because we're still rolling it out with one cohort. Um, I think I wouldn't expect that to start happening until we get to that cohort graduating. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And that cohort, and the cohorts behind it that have been putting evidence in all along. Um, gotcha. Right. Right. So how long is the program? How, so each it's about three. Program. It's about three years. It's a part-time master's degree, and it takes them about three years, two and a half, three years. Yeah. Are there any plans to make this tool available across the institution, or is it really just going to serve this one program? Well, the counseling program also has a face-to-face -face cohort that goes through every year. They're mm -hmm. not the two-year program when it's full-time, um, and they're off in the summer. And they have adopted um, HMH for the face-to-face -face courses as well. They're just starting to do that, but they have done that so that they can compare outcomes between their online cohorts and their face-to-face -face cohorts. And so that part of the face-to-face -face people have, have done it. There's been no discussion mm -hmm. of doing it anywhere else, and I think primarily that's because of the cost. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, and, and a program would have to have a pretty good idea of what they wanted to measure, um, you know, a really well thought out right. criteria that they wanted to measure to make it sort of more meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, right. Point. And it's really initially created for an accreditation standpoint. Um, the showcase type portfolios are kind of secondary. Um, we have one school that's using Digication a little bit, just barely starting. And are you seeking to do an LTI integration of Digication as well? They haven't asked us to, but because they've just started, I think they might ask us to. Um, and if they right. do, they'll certainly look at it and see what how mm -hmm. complicated. We, we had a programming position associated with doing Sakai integrations, and uh, we no longer have that. So um, if the existing programmers can, can rise to the occasion, that would be possible. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Because one of the challenges uh, we're facing here at the University of Virginia is we have different schools, like it sounds like you do, who want their own e-portfolio tools as well. And, and they both want integrations into our Sakai instance. And we're trying to figure out how to manage that just from a support standpoint. You know, do we make the tools available to everybody, but only those with accounts can actually use it? You know, that kind of thing. So I didn't know if you had encountered that challenge or if anybody else on the call has encountered that challenge. I will say that um, it's not exactly that it's stealth, but um, you have to have an admin actually configure the LTI tool for you for this particular okay. application. So we control it very manually by 
me adding the LTI tool to each of those counseling courses mm -hmm. so no one else could get it except the counseling department because they don't pay for it. No one else does pay, pays for it. Um, that's not scalable, obviously. Um, I think you could manage different schools that same way. You add the right. digital LTI tool to one and the other yeah. one. But like you said, it's not very scalable. It doesn't um, automate well. That's exactly right. And um, and so one of our schools is the biggest school at UVA. <laughs> and it's like, it might as well be everyone. So yeah. we can possibly manually add the tool to all of the courses that would be using it. And so we're, you know, we're kind of scratching our heads and wondering if templates might work. Um, and anyway, uh, if, yeah. if, if, if we find a magic bullet for that, uh, we will definitely share it with the rest of you. <laughs> and I hope likewise others will do the same. So it sounds like Jolie Tengen down at Duke also, they've also got that in issue. Um, and I'm sure others do too, or will. Is the cost per student based on FTE or actual users? It's a final question uh, we have. Based on actual users. Okay. I think. Mm -hmm. Because we give them a list. We give them a list right. and then they give us a, a, a what it sounds like then. Invoice. Yeah. So yeah, I think so. Okay, great. Well, Brenda, um, thank you again so much. It was really interesting and um, good information that, that we've had a chance to explore and, and discuss a little more. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to move on to uh, discuss and schedule further future topics. Um, and so, of course, next week we've got the Sakai Virtual Conference, and the week after that, Matt Burgess here at UVA is going to demo an integration we have with Now Comment. Uh, which is a, it's not exactly an LTI integration. We wish it were, but um, but it is an integration that we've done. But we have a lot of polls coming up after that, and also several unscheduled meeting topics down below. I'm I'm actually looking over an Etherpad again. Let me uh, copy and paste that URL into the chat so you guys can come over and look at that with me. Um, so we still have a lessons wish list kind of, you know, discussion around what things we would like to have in lessons uh, that we haven't really come back to. Um, the phase two of LEAP, and I'm sure when that is ready, the those folks will um, put themselves on the agenda. Sakai Podcasts and Polls is another one. Additional third-party um, LTI integrations. We have a few here at UVA um, in that list, and I think others also are using some of these. Uh, the documentation group update will get scheduled after the Sakai 11 code freeze. Um, and then some Aperio projects and Aperio fellows. So, um, does anybody want to sign up for any of those uh, existing unscheduled topics in the near future, or do you have anything else that you would like to talk about, say, on November 18th um, is our next most critical time slot to fill? So either in the chat or just come on the mic and please suggest something. Okay, so so I agree. Um, yes, it is more, I believe it is intended to be more of a brainstorming session. So I, I think that's great. And um, so come with your list, your wish list and um, we'll start putting that together and um, then that will be something that we can pass back to the um, to Chuck Hedrick 
and I don't know if we want to invite him to that session. Um, so I'll check in with Neil about that. Uh, I don't think we have to have Chuck in the meeting, but we might then want to have a follow-up if he's not able to make that meeting. Um, then we should um, invite him when he can join us and, and review that list again with him. Um, so let me invite Chuck Hedrick to that. Thank you for getting that going. And then Louisa says that they can also, sh uh, they have lessons, UX testing results to share. Awesome. That would be a good, um, that would be a good update for us um, to start off that conversation, Louisa. So um, would you be able to do that on the 18th as well? Oh, that'd be great. So I'm going to put that here as well so I don't forget it. Oh, okay, testing is next week. Great. Well, that's good timing then. Very timely. Okay, so we have the 18th. Anybody ha want to volunteer in the last couple minutes we have for a uh, topic on December 2nd? Or we can come back to that on November 11th. Um, it's fine. Okay, well, I'm going to leave it at that since we're close to time. And thank you, uh, Sala and Louisa, for chiming in, and Terry. Uh, and again, thanks to Brenda for the really good presentation on the HMH portfolio. That was really interesting, and I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, adjourn our meeting, unless anybody has anything else they want to bring up before we adjourn. Okay, well, thank you all, and uh, looking forward to seeing you online next week at the Sakai Virtual Conference. Thank you.